Hello, this is um, Mr. Ketcherside, Assistant Professor of Nursing, College of the Mainland. We're going to be talking a little bit about the gastrointestinal system. This is the third lecture in a series of lectures on the gastrointestinal system. Um, this one is going to be about assessment to some degree and then the upper GI tract. The GI tract is the part of the body that um, we use to consume, chew, digest, and expel food products um, in order to get the nutrients that our body needs, all the nutritious um, micro and macro ingredients that we talked about in the nutrition chapter. Um, I think most of us understand this pretty well. We all took anatomy and physiology. I'm not going to belabor any points here because of your awareness of that. Just make sure that you understand all of the landmarks here that are, are demonstrated on the slide. We will be talking about the entire GI tract during the next two lectures with the exception of the um, associated organs like the liver, spleen, gallbladder, these will be, um, the issues with those will be um, taken care of in your enhanced and complex classes. I would be aware of your different layers um, of the GI tract, the mucosal lining, the innermost layer, submucosa, which is the connective tissue, um, the outer, the muscle, the different layers of the muscles involved, and the outermost layer, which is the serosa. You need to be aware of, of those. Also be aware that the enteric nervous system um, works independently um, of the central nervous system. There's you know a lot of things that are um, that you can put conscious effort in such as chewing, swallowing, and defecating, but for the most part a lot of the things that go on in the GI tract um, occur autonomically, autonomously um, as part of the enteric nervous system. This slide talks about how the circulatory system feeds the GI tract, so it's very important to know um, these anatomical, geographical uh, pieces to the puzzle. And this layer here, when we're talking about peritoneum, peritoneal cavity, this is extremely important when we're talking about potential complications of um, GI disruptions. And I'm going to quote a little bit from the book. The peritoneum almost completely covers the abdominal organs. The two layers of the peritoneum are the parietal layer, which lines the abdominal cavity wall, and the visceral layer, which covers the abdominal organs. The peritoneal cavity is the potential space between the parietal and visceral layers. The two folds of the peritoneum are the mesentery and the omentum. The mesentery attaches the small intestine and the large and part of the large intestine to the posterior abdominal wall. It also contains blood and lymph vessels. The omentum hangs like an apron from the stomach to the intestines. It contains fat and lymph nodes. The big issue here I want you to be aware of and conscious of is that peritoneal cavity, um, the potential space between two layers. It's, you know, a vacuum in there, so um, these may be together, but anytime your stomach or intestines have an injury, whether it's chemical or mechanical, that tears through the lining of the, the, the part of the organ that's involved, stomach contents or um, balance contents can leak out into this peritoneal cavity. And because there's no natural uh, blood circulation that can um, address this with your immune system, um, it can cause major complications major inflammation, and eventually death if it's not taken care of quickly.
The main function of the GI system, like we said, is to supply nutrients to the body cells. Um, this is accomplished through ingestion, digestion, and absorption, which we again talked about. Again, more of the same. Digestion and absorption occurs in the stomach and in the small intestine. Here's a nice graph that shows you the different layers of um, the lining of the stomach and the inside of the stomach itself and where it originates and terminates in the esophagus and into the duodenum. This slide we're talking about gastric secretions um, in the stomach. So the chief cells create pepsinogen and the parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid water and the intrinsic factor. So this is basically um, the stew that's in your stomach that's going to do the chemical breakdown. Um, so again, we know that food is chemically and physically broken down, starting with the saliva in the mouth. Um, protein, pepsin works on protein in the stomach, and um, the small intestines will work also on protein. Um, but it also is where your carbohydrates and fats are broken down and absorbed. Transfer of the end products, those final broken down components, those amino acids, those simple sugars, those the lipids that we've um, have been broken out of the pizza that we ate an hour ago. Most of this occurs in the small intestine. There are different sections of the small intestine, so these are important to know. Uh, the duodenum is the part that comes right out of the, the stomach. Um, the jejunum follows that. The large intestine, which kind of wraps around the, the whole peritoneal cavity, um, this is where water and electrolytes are absorbed. This is where the final fluids are pulled out of the mass that's coming through the body until it's defecated um, finally at the end. Here's a slide that talks about that. The gerontological, the aging effects that happens on the GI tract, um, this has a lot to do with just aging itself. Um, and we talked a little bit about this in nutrition, so I'm not going to spend um, too much time on it. Other things related to aging, constipation is the number one health complaint of older Americans. Um, other things begin to decrease and become diseased. Um, and then this, there's usually some socioeconomic issues that relate to uh, procurement of food with this um, population. Assessments. Um, so when we're doing our subjective and objective um, assessments, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You guys have had um, your, your health assessment class already. Um, just making sure that you're not only doing the physical part of the GI, but also your nutrition assessment kind of in conjunction with that. And I'm just going to go through these slides because we covered you've covered this already in the program. Just make sure that you review these slides um, when you're preparing for your studies and uh, preparing for your exams. Always make sure you're doing a physical assessment of the abdominal area when you're um, assessing your patients during your clinical and in your um, your clinical activities once you've graduated and moved on into the workforce.
this slide um, shows kind of the order of doing things with the GI um, assessment. Sometimes the physical assessment with GI and GU um, assessments can be kind of uncomfortable, um, especially when we're talking about the rectum and the anus. Um, make sure that you do this appropriately with your patients, especially if there's issues um, with um, GI motility, constipation, um, or you're worried about skin integrity and so forth. Um, so just be careful. You should never do a digital exam though unless you're um, trying to disimpact a patient. A lot of times we'll do this uh, with a barium enema so that um, gas and food and the lining of the stomach um, can be shown, or the lining of the intestines and so forth can be very um, obvious uh, where they might be too opaque to consider otherwise. Whereas x-ray um, can succeed check out for gross abnormalities. If things need to be um, examined more closely, then we move into visual inspections um, or more complicated uh, scans such as CT or MRI. One of the things um, that we do with these patients are the end endoscopic procedures. Um, this is, these allow us to do direct visualizations of the GI structures. Um, it's a camera on a flexible um, stick that goes either down your mouth into your stomach and checking the duodenum tube or uh, through the anus to look at the lower intestine. These can be moved around so that the physician or provider can see different areas um, of the place that they're looking at. It can also provide flushing, so if they're trying to move blood or some other material to see the surface better, it can do that. Also with these scopes, a lot of times they're able to do minor cauterization. If there's a, a small bleed or a small ulcer that's bleeding, um, they can close that um, while they're doing that scope. Also, they're able to um, take samples. If they need to do a sample of something that looks suspicious, um, this will allow them to, to do that as well while they're doing the procedure. One kind of radiological procedure is called the virtual colonoscopy, and this is um, This is a combination of CAT scan and MRI scanning with um, computer virtual reality software. The scanning is uh, done with the CT and the MRI, and then the software allows them to go through the different parts of the body that they need to, to see, um, detect any kind of colon, intestinal polyps or cancers or diverticulosis or lower GI bleeding. Uh, they would have to have bowel prep um, for this so that the colon is clear. The two major um, scopes that you're going to be familiar with, that you're going to be utilizing in the hospital system, is the EGD and the colonoscopy. Uh, this is for patients that are admitted with acute abdominal issues, um, GI bleeding um, of unknown origin, um, and perhaps someone that's too unstable to do this on an outpatient basis. If there's a question of hemorrhaging, this patient would be admitted rather than waiting a week or two to come into the, the outpatient clinic. 
the EGD is the es es esophagogastroduodenoscopy, and you'll be able to see that in your table um, 3811 um, on page 843, I believe. Yes, it's the second procedure. It's commonly abbreviated into EGD. This is where the scope goes into the mouth, down through the esophagus, into the stomach, and into the duodenum to look to see if there's any issues there that need to be taken care of. Generally, the patient needs to be in PO after midnight. They need to have a consent signed before that procedure. Um, and it usually takes place under um, a very mild form of anesthesia, not general anesthesia. Not usually. It doesn't have to be general anesthesia. For the colonoscopy, um, the preparation for this tends to be a little more um, difficult for the patient. Generally, the night, not only do they have to be in for you after midnight, but generally the preparations for this start the, the night before, the evening before, um, where they'll start to take this huge gallon of Go Lightly. Um, I can't remember the, the generic name for that, but it's a gallon of, of basically um, some sort of laxative and, and bulk with the water because you've got to add like a gallon of water to it. Um, that allows them to, you know, evacuate the entire um, small and lower intestine. Um, usually that's not enough, though. The doctor will generally order some other stimulants and some other laxatives. So there'll be two or three different kinds of medications overall to, given to, um, to take care of this, not just um, one. So it's like we're attacking the problem at all ends, whether it's, you know, getting that bolus of fluid and fiber to clean things out, but also to stimulate the bowel um, to get rid of the feces. It's very important um, that this patient have a bedside commode, um, especially when they're still on the go lightly. They may have an urge um, that's not going to make it to, to, to the patient's hospital bathroom. So they need that for emergencies. They don't necessarily have to use it, but you need to keep it there for emergencies. Um, your goal with the colonoscopy overnight is to make sure that the bow the um, what's coming of the bowels is becoming clear. You have to have this patient clear um, by the time they go to the procedure. And a lot of times, um, you know, the endoscopy units will start opening up at 6 o'clock in the morning. So, you know, by 5 or 6 o'clock, this patient needs to be completely clear of feces. If they're still expelling water, um, that's fine, um, but that needs to be clear or yellow. Um, it can't be dark, cloudy, um, or having feces. If it's still, if it's not clear, um, you need to call the physician to get an order for something um, like an enema. Um, to clear that up, or the, or to continue with with more medication so that the patient can reschedule. Absolutely, do not ever send a patient to the endo suite for a colonoscopy if they're not clear. Um, that's just bad business because they're not going to be able to um, push a scope up there into the colon if the patient still has a bowel full of feces. Here's a picture that demonstrates um, what the colon should look like um, when they're advancing the scope inside. And this slide is for what they call a capsule colonoscopy, um, which is kind of like um, an EGD and a colonoscopy combined. So, between an EGD and a colonoscopy, just real quickly trying to guess which part of the GI tract is not captured um, with an EGD and a colonoscopy. And I'll give you two or three seconds to try to, to f figure that out. If you guessed small intestine, you were correct. The, so the capsule um, 
the capsule version is going to take care of that. It's going to go through the entire system. The problem with this, the reason it's not as popular as some of the others is because you're not going to have control over the camera. You're not going to be able to take biopsies. You're not going to be able to um, cauterize any bleeds or polyps that you see. Um, it's just going to tumble through like the magic school bus um, until it comes out at the other end. Okay, we're going to start talking about upper gastrointestinal problems. First thing we're going to talk about is nausea and vomiting, along with diarrhea, this which we'll talk about in lower intestinal. Um, this is probably one of the most common GI complaints you're going to have. Uh, just remember these are usually symptoms of something else. Um, or related to something else. They are not diseases on their own. Nausea is a feeling of discomfort in the epigastric area. Um, you get the urge to vomit. Um, and vomiting, vomiting itself, the forceful ejection of partially digested, digested food and secretions. And there could be several reasons for this, um, obviously. GI problems that we're going to talk about in pregnancy, obviously but also other illnesses such as CNS disorders or cardiovascular um, disorders could be a part of that. One thing that you'll notice is when you take patient, uh, care of patients with um, pneumonia and even sometimes asthma, sometimes these patients will experience nausea and vomiting. And it's mostly just because of the constant coughing, um, which sometimes will create that urge to vomit or because of the secretions that they're swallowing from the pneumonia. So what is, how does it work? Stimuli from the GI tract um, send impulses um, to receptors in the medulla to initiate the reflex, the vomiting reflex, um, re responds to Stimuli from drugs, toxins, and motion, um, and so forth, and it explains that here. This is not going to be um, an area that we delve too far into. This is you know, something very common um, that happens in patients with GI issues. Of course, the question is, is how do we manage this? Well, first we identify like anything else, identify the cause. Any complications before we administer um, symptom relief? Um, there's a whole host of medications that we can give for this, and we'll delve more into this when we get into um, our pharmacology. Clinical manifestations, so if a person's vomiting all the time, um, it can cause um, issues with anorexia, not wanting to eat because of the constant nausea. Weight loss, um, which would also then uh, create fluid and electrolyte imbalances and so forth. When you have a patient that is nausea, it has nausea and vomiting, it's very important to do a good history and assessment to make sure you're capturing all those data points that might point you to a cause. If there is emesis, it's very important that this be measured and defined and documented so that uh, the doctor can know what's going on as well. Partially digested food could be a gastric outlet obstruction. Um, fecal odor and bile could be as from an obstruction below the pylorus. Um, bile could show an obstruction. Bright red blood could indicate active bleeding, while coffee ground emesis would, could indicate gastric bleeding, and then determine if the vomiting is, you know, regurgitation or if it's projectile. Here are our nursing diagnoses that are associated with 
nausea and vomiting, which have to do with the absence of intake because of um, stuff moving out of the body. Goals are pretty much common sense. Um, we don't want them to vomit. We want them to probably stop within the shift, regain normal hydration and electrolyte status, um, and their fluid balance needs to return to normal as well. Things that we do, um, especially if they're dehydrated, admit them to acute care, keep them in PO, give them IV fluids to uh, support the blood pressure and uh, body fluid balance. NG tube, um, especially if there's projectile vomiting, keeping the stomach um, empty so that um, there's no constant urge to vomit. And then monitor eyes and nose, particularly your urine output. It's always, always, always very important to pay attention to your urine output if you have a patient that you suspect might be dehydrated for any reason. Um, we keep the IV fluids going until the patient can start to tolerate um, oral foods and then when that's possible, we need to get a dietitian consult, usually starting the patients off on clear liquids before we advance over time. Um, if it's an outpatient setting, we kind of would treat it the same way mostly. Outcomes we're wanting, you know, reduction or cessation of vomiting and nausea electrolytes and normal limits, and the patient able to take adequate fluid and nutrient intake, preferably without nausea vomiting. With gerontological um, considerations, um, consider cardiac or renal issues. Be very cautious with aspiration precautions. You don't want these patients um, having emesis and then choking on it in their lungs. Now we're going to focus a little bit on esophageal disorders. So the first disease we're going to talk about is gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD. This is the chronic syndrome of mucosal damage due to the reflux of stomach acid into the lower esophagus. We used to call this heartburn. That's the lay term for it. It's kind of where the acidic gastric contents overwhelm, overwhelm your esophageal defenses, um, causing irritation and inflammation when that acid gets into the esophagus. Usually this is um, related to an incompetent sphincter, the one that um, joins your esophagus to your stomach. Um, what can affect the pressure to make that incompetent? Usually food and drugs, overeating, obesity, smoking, um, and so forth. I will tell you, there's another disease we're going to cover a little bit later, hiatal hernia. And while these two things have different pathophysiologies, and when it comes to surgical correction, they have different methods for that, when it comes to nursing interventions and symptoms and medication, these are going to be completely identical because they both result in stomach acid being regurgitated into the esophagus. Here is a graph of the um, esophagus and the stomach to kind of show you where um, these things will happen. Clinical manifestations, heartburn or pyrosis. This is a burning or tight sensation under the lower sternum, spreads into the throat and jaw. Sometimes this mimics angina, but would be relieved with antacids. Dyspepsia, pain or discomfort in the lower abdomen. Regurgitation, hot, bitter, or sour liquid in the mouth of throat, respiratory, wheezing, coughing, dyspnea, nighttime disturbance, um, 
choking at night. Um, these are different ways you can tell this person might have GERD. Complications from this could be ulcerations in the esophagus, which can lead to scar tissue, stricture, and dysphagia. Over time, this can turn into Barrett's esophagus, which is where some of the cells, over time, being exposed to stomach acid for prolonged periods of time, can um, turn into cancer cells. So you have to be very careful with that. You can also aspirate and um, have aspiration pneumonia come from that if there's too much that comes up from your stomach. And then another thing which is more cosmetic than anything is dental erosion. Um, the enamel on your teeth are not meant to withstand stomach acid. If um, GERD is suspected, there are some diagnostic studies, which you can see on table 41.8 in your book. These are determined by the response um, to behavioral and drug therapies. Um, sometimes we can do an upper GI and an esophagram, which is a barium swallow. And there's some other studies as well to validate this medically. This is primarily um, a disease of lifestyle, the American lifestyle to begin with, overeating and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of teaching that goes into that. We can teach our patients instead of, you know, eating the large meals, try to break those up um, into smaller meals and try to lessen the num amount of fat that you've got in your diet. Try to avoid alcohol, caffeine, and smoking. Sit upright for two to three hours after meals. Avoid tight clothing at waist or bending over after eating. Avoid eating three hours before bedtime. Um, weight reduction, drug therapy. The drug therapy um, is meant to decrease the volume and acidity of reflux um, so that that acid when it is regurgitated is not eating away at the mucosa uh, lining of your esophagus. These are mostly PPIs or proton pump inhibitors or histamine 2 receptor blockers. Other things like antacids and cholinergic drugs can help. Um, they're primarily what is used or they're not primarily what is used. The PPIs and histamine 2 receptor blockers are the number one uh, drugs for these. And for most of the, most point, most of the time you can get these um, over the counter. Okay, it's gonna start, we're gonna start talking a little bit about drug therapy here, but I'm really not. I'm just gonna go through these slides because we're doing a whole section on pharmacology, but this slide talks about PPIs. This slide talks about the H2 receptors and the prokinetics. This slide talks about antacids. With food, um, nutritional therapy, there's no real specific diet except, you know, try to keep the fat low and try to um, avoid large meals, do the small meal thing, um, and try to limit the, how soon you're eating before bedtime. And try to lose weight, that will help with the abdominal pressure. Surgical therapy, um, this is meant to reduce the reflux and to enhance the function of that sphincter. Um, not gonna really get too far into these most of the time, um, this will not advance to the point where this is needed. It's usually managed pretty well with uh, medications. Um, but the two, the two um, procedures that can be done are the Neeson or the toupee fund applications.
This um, slide shows you about the Neeson procedure. Okay, we're going to keep going. We're going to talk about hiatal hernia. Um, I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on the therapy slides or the treatment slides because a lot of these are identical to um, GERD, but the patho is different. This is where you have a herniation. It's not where the sphincter is not working. Remember GERD, you got that sphincter between your esophagus and your stomach that relaxes too much because of the pressure beneath um, the diaphragm. With hiatal hernia, you've actually got stomach coming through the diaphragm into the esophagus um, and opening into the diaphragm. And I'll, we'll show you a slide in just a second. But there's two slot, there's two different kinds. There's the sliding and the parasophageal, or the rolling hiatal hernia, which we'll show you in just a minute. Here's what it looks like. You can see the stomach pushing its way through the diaphragm itself, um, relaxing that sphincter. And then the second one here, where um, that sphincter may stay where it's supposed to, but the stomach's coming up around the sphincter anyway. Um, structurally, this is where weakened muscle in the diaphragm um, opens up so that the stomach can come through. It's also related to increased intra-abdominal pressure, just like GERD. It has a lot of the same symptoms, um, but it can also have some different complications other than the ones that are similar to GERD. You can also have hemorrhage, stenosis, and strangulation, which is where the, um, the tightness of the opening uh, strangles off circulation into that small hernia, which would kill the tissue um, and set up for gangrene. Diagnostics are the same, barium swallow or endoscopy. Um, treatment, conservative first, try to reduce the pressure, try to reduce the acid. Um, if that's not working, we have to do um, the surgical repair. And you're probably going to have more surgeries with the hiatal hernia than you would with GERD. The type of surgeries are below, a herniotomy, a herniorophy, a fundi application, and gastropexy. With everything else, things change with age. Um, with GERD and hiatal hernia, um, some drugs may decrease LES pressure more than it would otherwise. The thing that you do have to watch with the older adults is esophageal bleeding or aspirations um, or aspiration pneumonia. This could be a more severe sign. Um, but otherwise, you would manage it as you would with younger adults. I'm going to go to the stomach and the upper intestine, the upper small intestine. Peptic ulcer disease. This is really going to be the major disease that we're going to talk about until we get to the, um, the lower GI tract. This is where, and we've got a really good slide, and your book's got a good graphic too. Um, trying to look ahead here. So what's going on here is, remember we were talking about pepsin and hydrochloric acid. These are really strong acids. Um, how does your GI tract from your mouth um, to your anus, how does it ever tolerate this to begin with? Well, for the first First part, most of it is supposed to stay and remain in the stomach um, and, and go no further really than like the duodenum maybe um, before it's, it's reabsorbed. Um, and so if the t at some point, stomach acid can become more acidic than the um, geographic surfaces of your stomach can manage. So it's supposed to stay at a certain level. When it becomes more 
acidic than it can tolerate, then it begins to eat at the mucosal layer, then the submucosal layer, um, and then it can create an ulcer or perforate into the and allow the stomach contents to escape into the peritoneal cavity. Um, so it's, it's really all about the game here. It's really all about controlling the acid and so to prevent the complications that will happen. Susceptible areas of the GI tract, the lower esophagus, the stomach itself, even though it's where this acid is, duodenum, um, and any post-op gastrojejunal astomosis. Um, anastomosis. Um, types, there's two different types. There's acute peptic ulcer disease, which is superficial erosion and minimal inflammation and chronic where you have significant erosion into the muscular wall um, with formation of fibrous tissue um, and that it's present continuously over a longer duration. Gastric ulcers, uh, these are more prevalent in females older than 50. Um, what can typically cause these, the acid um, change, is the b bacteria called helio Helicobacteria pylori, NSAIDs, or bile reflux. Um, there is an increase in mortality with these, and there's a high rate of recurrence. With duodenal ulcers, these are for younger people, usually 35 to 45. These are also typically caused by H. pylori because of the high HCL secretion. Um, you're higher at risk if you have COPD, cirrhosis, pancreatitis, hyperpyrothyroidism, or some other diseases. They typically occur, disappear, and recur. This is the graph I was talking about, 41-9, um, that's real important to kind of show you um, what the gastric lining looks like um, with and without the excessive erosion of um, acid. So where you see the word erosion, if you look at the top left or right around it, that's what would be normal um, tissue, and then the erosion part is where the acid begins to eat through that mucus layer. When it goes down into the, the muscle itself, we have an acute ulcer. Um, when it's deep into the, um, the muscularis um, and they're scarring, we call it a chronic ulcer. And here is an extreme example of a stomach ulcer. Risk factors, um, H. pylori is a big reason these happen. Um, can be also medication induced, especially if you're on corticosteroids or anticoagulants and lifestyle, alcohol, smoking, caffeine, um, psychological distress. Um, so you can see probably a lot of it is lifestyle related. Here's a pathophysiology map about the um, how this happens. You start with um, the introduction of acids, bile salts, aspirin, or whatever those um, factors are that probably make the stomach more acidic and then it shows you how it gets all the way down to ulceration. Map two of this um, here, um, area. Because the two different types of ulcers, gastric and duodenal, have different mortalities, um, they happen in different groups of people, um, they have different durations. Um, we need to be able to tell the difference between them. This is very important. With gastric ulcers, the discomfort is generally high in the epigastrum, 
and occurs about one to two hours after meals. The pain is described as burning and gaseous. Food tends to worsen the pain. In duodenal ulcers, symptoms occur when gastric acid comes in contact with the ulcers. With meal ingestion, food is present to help buffer the acid. Symptoms usually um, occur two to five hours after the meal, being burning and cramp-like. But while the person is eating, the pain can go away because it's, it's um, absorbing the acid. So with gastric ulcers, food causes pain. With duodenal ulcers, food relieves pain. So in addition to those other differences, you'll need to know those differences, those uh, unique things as well. The other point that's very important on this slide is perforation. This is, you might think, well, the acid knows when to stop um, once it hits the um, bottom of the barrel, so to speak, the end of the um, muscularis around the stomach. False. No, it's not going to have. That's not what's going to happen. If it's not treated, and the acid is not relieved, it will continue to eat all the way through the stomach wall. That is perforation. And sometimes with gastric ulcers, perforation may actually be the first symptom. And what happens then is you're having um, stomach acid and stomach contents emptying into the um, <clears throat> peritoneal cavity, which has no system of absorbing that, getting rid of it, allowing your cardiovascular system, your, your immune system to absorb it or to fight it. It's just there. It's going to cause peritonitis and, you know, really bad situation, which can be fatal um, if not treated, usually surgically. Um, and we'll talk about that later. <clears throat> Diagnostics, endoscopy, usually most of these ulcers and erosions are going to be um, diagnosed with a EGD or a um, barium swallow. Also, they want to obtain specimens for H. pylori to put you on the right antibiotics for that. Here's an example of the EGD. Um, Treatment goals first, decreased acidity and enhance the mucosal defense system. We always do conservative care first, adequate rest, no smoking, no alcohol, stress management, dietary modification, and then manage the pain if needed. Um, and then we start with the PPIs and the H2 receptor blockers to reduce the acid itself. If that's not working, we do the endoscopic evaluation um, to see what's going on. Drug therapy. Um, reduce gastric acid secretion with PPIs. Uh, we're not going to, again, spend too much time on those because we've got a whole section to talk about that. Eliminate the H. pylori with antibiotics. Patient education. Um, the antibiotic therapy itself is usually 14 days of penicillin, unless they're allergic, in which we put them on metro, uh, nadaz, that word right there, bismuth alone, or combined with tetracycline and metro niadazole. Protein pump inhibitors, these are more effective than H2 receptor blockers, but we use both. Um, and then sucrophate, which can coat um, the stomach and bind with some of those things to make it feel better. But a lot of these binders and a lot of these antacids that we'll talk about when we get into drugs, 
got to watch out with these because they also have an effect on the drugs, the other medications that you might be taking. Pretty much talked about that already. Now these next two slides you really need to pay attention because we're going to be talking about the three major complications of peptic ulcer disease. And two of these are major complications for anything along the tract from the esophagus to, to the colon. So you have to be very, very patient and listen and understand that all three of these are medical emergencies. The first one is hemorrhage. Um, and with peptic ulcer disease, this is duodenal. This is more likely to turn um, into a bloodbath, so to speak, because of the vasculature um, in the duodenum. And what's the what's the what's the issue with hemorrhage? What's so special? Why is it such a medical emergency? I mean, a hemorrhage of any kind is is bad, but why is it especially bad? Um, if it's in your GI tract, because you can't see it. It's not going to announce itself. Your patient's not going to ring the, the, the call light and say, I think my duodenum is hemorrhaging. You're not, you're not going to have any um, subjective signs and symptoms. You may not know about it until it's relatively late, until the patient has lost a unit or two of blood into their GI tract. Remember the Duodenum is just underneath the stomach. It's got a whole long ways to go all the way down the um, <clears throat> GI tract, the rest of your, your colon, your upper and lower intestine, before it may come out and give you something to worry about, right? <clears throat> so this is a big issue. So what is it, how, how can you tell if a patient's got a hemorrhage before the blood becomes obvious? If you've got a patient with a peptic ulcer, ulcer disease, or a peptic ulcer you know or suspect they have a peptic ulcer, and their blood pressure starts to go down, that's a big sign. I'm losing volume. I don't know why. It's unexplained. Um, they're in here for ulcer. I may have a, I may have a hemorrhage going on. That's the way you've got to think. Perforation, this is probably the most lethal. This is where you have GI contents spilling directly into the peritoneal cavity. And remember, this is the one area of the body that's not connected uh, by capillaries and all of that stuff that connects us to the great old immune system to fight bacteria and foreign bodies. When things get into the peritoneal cavity, which they're never, ever supposed to do, this requires medical attention or a phone call to the funeral home. This will kill you if it's not dealt with. With this, the GI content spilled directly into the cavity. The patient's going to have sudden, severe abdominal pain radiating to the back or shoulders. There's not going to be any relief with food or antacids. The abdomen can become rigid and board-like. May not be any bowel sounds. They may be absent. Patient could start vomiting with sh shallow respirations. Pulse becoming increased and weak. Signs of shock. We're seeing signs of shock here. When any of these are combined with a rigid or board-like abdomen, this patient is most likely having a perforation. This patient needs to go to the OR yesterday so that, you know, the peritonitis doesn't turn into a huge, huge septic situation which can't be resolved um, or which could cause... Um, you know, destruction of tissue and gangrene in in the abdominal cavity, which and when you get stuff in there, it's just too hard, really almost impossible to clean up and, and get rid of completely. People do survive it occasionally, 
but it's a big mess and it's nasty and it but it is very lethal. Intensity of the perforation is proportional to the amount and length of time the spillage has gone unnoticed. Perforation of untreated bacterial peritonitis will occur within 6 to 12 hours. The immediate focus is to stop the spillage and to restore blood volume. So we're going to put an NG tube in them for aspiration and gastric decompression. IV fluids and blood to restore the blood volume. Central line, EKG, urinary catheter. The patient has small perforations. Sometimes these can um, self-seal and you would need to monitor for obstruction. But with the larger perforations, this patient's going to have to have surgery to clean out the peritoneal cavity and to close the wound. What I don't want, and you just have to be very, very um, careful with your assessment, I can't tell you how many times I emphasize this every semester and there's always two or three students who during a test question will see the board-like or rigid abdomen and they don't think perforation. If this ha I hate to be giving away a test question, but this is a patient safety issue with me. If you have a patient that you suspect has a, pe a peptic ulcer disease and they've got a rigid board-like stomach, this patient probably has a perforation and they need to be in the OR now. And if you're not calling your surgeon or your primary attending physician and ringing the church bells and all the alarms, you're being a horrible, horrible nurse. Enough said. Gastric outlet obstruction. This is the third complication that's really just kind of restricted to uh, peptic ulcer disease. The rest of them can happen with things of the, the um, esophagus, they can happen in your intestines, um, they can happen in your stomach. But gastric outlet obstruction obviously just happens in the stomach. This is where you have edema, inflammation, pyelorospasm, or scar tissue, which can cause obstruction in the distal stomach, blocking that gastric um, outlet. And what happens there is the stomach will fill and dilate causing discomfort and pain, which worsens. Um, the patient may have projectile vomiting. Um, the treatment then is to decompress with the NG tube, get, get them going with their acid-reducing medications, manage their pain, um, and then get the patient ready for surgery where they can dilate the opening um, that way. Your assessments are super critical um, when you're suspecting some of these complications or diseases uh, re related to possible ulcers or actual ulcers. Not just your general physical assessment, but GI symptoms and whatever the diagnostics tell us are going on. Nursing diagnosis are going to be around pain, awareness, nausea. Goals are to reduce the discomfort, um, get rid of the signs of complications, um, leading the, pa the pathway down to healing, whether that's through conservative or um, invasive means. But we have to be very quick to understand who, which of our patients might be at risk and um, what symptoms they're having um, that could show risk and to should tell them to report those things to us right away. <clears throat> Again, we're doing, can't feed them anything while this is going on, getting an NG tube, to, NG tube to deflate the stomach, IV fluids to maintain the blood pressure, vital signs, and monitor for shock. And we're just kind of going over that again.
um, for all three of the complications. We've talked about those, so I'm not going to spend too much time going over them again. If there we're in an ambulatory care uh, setting, we're just going to do a lot of dietary lifestyle modification, education, stress management, um, making sure they know who to follow up if things worsen. Gerontological considerations. The, um, this disease can kill your patient, so you need to be aware of what those morbidities, mortalities are, and what you can do to help heal or um, relieve your patient's discomfort. Gastritis is our next disease. Um, this is the inflammation of the gastric mucosa. This can be acute or chronic. Breakdown of the gastric mucosal barrier, barrier allowing Hydrochloric acid and pepsin to diffuse back into the mucosa, resulting in tissue edema, disruption of capillary walls, loss of plasma into gastric lumen, and possible hemorrhage. So basically, this is kind of the precursor to peptic ulcer disease. This is when <clears throat> the acid itself is just creating an inflamed state in the stomach. Your textbook or your syllabus also talks about stomatitis and stomatitis is really gastritis of the esophagus if you're having GERD or hiatal hernia the inflammation would be called stomatitis. Drug related gastritis could be from NSAIDs. Um, they can increase the risk for ulcers or increase the bleeding related to ulcers. Any anticoagulant therapy, corticosteroids, digitalis, alcohol use, lots of spicy foods. So down here in Texas, if you have a tendency to have ulcers and so forth, maybe we shouldn't eat all those stuffed jalapenos and all those wonderful peppers that we love from our Tex-Mex restaurants. Heliobacter, Heliobacter pylori is a big cause of these. Obviously, if it causes the ulcer, it causes the part that um, precedes the ulcer. Um, we would diagnose this the same way, getting a scope to see what's going on, do an NG tube to decompress the stomach and manage the um, psychologic stress. These can cause the same issues that an ulcer would, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, um, and so forth. Diagnostic studies are based on symptoms, uh, history of drug or alcohol use, the endoscopy, H. pylori testing, which we talked about, stool for occult blood, With acute gastritis, we need to identify the cause and prevent it or avoid it and then support the symptoms after that with um, IV fluids, rest, and monitoring for dehydration. With any of these issues related to um, complications related to stomach acid becoming more acidic, we're going to be using PPIs or H2 receptor blockers. Um, chronic gastritis, um, in addition to things that we would do for acute, we would also want to make sure they stop smoking and that they change their meals to six small meals a day with non-irritating foods. What is upper gastrointestinal bleeding? There's three different kinds. There's hematemesis, which is bloody vomitus, bright red, or coffee grounds, which was, means it's been in contact with hydrochloric acid, melina, which is black tarry stools, and occult blood, um, guaiac testing from gastric secretions, vomitus, 
or stool. This can be caused in the stomach or the duodenum. It's usually related to peptic ulcer disease. This is a co actually a complication as we talked about a peptic ulcer disease. It can also be stress-related mucosal disease, which are physiological stress ulcers um, related to other illnesses or stress. Usually diagnosed with the endoscopy or angiography. CBC would show if the blood is low. BUN would um, show um, GI tract bacteria breakdown proteins. Um, other serum electrolytes, PT, PTT, liver enzymes, these may help as well. A massive GI bleed is where you have greater than uh, 1,500 mLs of blood loss or more. Uh, which is about 25% of the intravascular volume. Um, so those ha that has to be, that's a medical emergency. In a women's department, if they were to have this much blood loss, it's like almost a code situation. So you have to sh check your patient for shock, tachycardia, weak pulse, hypotension, cool extremities, prolonged capillary refill, and monitor the urine output. Obviously, they're going to need hemodynamic monitoring, oxygen administration, assess the patient for perforation and peritonitis, and how would we do that? Tense, rigid abdomen, and presence or absence of bowel sounds. Administer IV fluids and administer blood and blood transfusion. Obviously, we're losing volume. We're going to be giving blood and IV fluids. <clears throat> Endoscopic therapy is the first line management within 24 hours to determine the need for surgery. The goal there is to coagulate or thrombose the bleed. So this is where the the G the EGD is actually going to go in there and cauterize whatever is causing the bleed or to determine whether we need surgery or not. <clears throat> With surgical uh, therapy, this is done if the site's identified and other interventions have failed, and the uh, patient requires more than 2,000 2, mLs of blood, or if the patient's in shock. Drug therapy is going to be um, PPIs by IV, then antacids after the acute phase. Assessment, we ought to know by now what we're going to be looking for, things that would show us that the patient's either in shock, that their GI tract may not be working, or that they could have lost a significant amount of blood. Our nursing diagnoses, impaired cardiac output related to blood loss, fluid imbalance is the same, ineffective tissue perfusion, this again is related to the, the lowered blood volume and anxiety. Goals would be to prevent the bleeding, of course, treat the cause, bring us back to a normal state and with minimal pain or anxiety. From an intervention standpoint, it's going to be identification and patient education. And the education is going to be around toxic drugs, um, gastric irritants, testing for occult blood, avoiding pressure or anxiety. Acute care is going to um, be always watching the, your ABCs, your airways, breathing, circulation making sure the patient has two large bore IVs in case we have to go to surgery immediately, oxygen EKG because of the potential in perfusion variance with the, the low volume means less oxygen to the tissues. Labs um, would be CBCs, clotting studies, type and cross for obvious reasons.
NG tube to decompress the stomach, urinary catheter to measure urinary output, because with low blood, we could obviously not have our kidneys perfusing like they need to. Like with acute care, we're going to put it in an NG tube, make sure it's in the correct position, and we're essentially aspirating for blood. And if there is blood, we um, drain that out. We assess stool and vomitus for blood. Make sure if we're coming down off of alcoholic DT that we're monitoring them for withdrawals. If the patient is in ambulatory care, most of what you're going to do is education to prevent it from getting worse than it was or is. The outcomes we're looking for is no more bleeding, normal blood volume. Everything is in the state it's supposed to be in. The next thing we're going to talk about is foodborne illness. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, just to say this is food poisoning. Um, and this is when what happens when we eat unprepared or underprepared food. There's about 250 specific illnesses, most due to bacteria growing during the harvesting or processing storage or final shipping processes. This exhibits itself as vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, cramping, abdominal pain, um, interventions are making sure the patient knows how to um, um, prepare foods correctly. If it happened at a restaurant, making sure we've notified the health department um, and then correcting any fluid imbalances due to the vomiting and checking for E. coli since this could um, actually lead to kidney failure if we're not careful. This one is completely avoided with adequately prepared food. Um, so this is why I really don't like family banquets in the backyard or church eatings on the meetings on the ground because the, the food can tend to be off temperature uh, for a period of time leading to something like this. Okay, this is the end of lecture three. Thank you very much.